Welcome to everybody. I'm absolutely delighted to have you here. I'm Jenny Foster, Fair Trade Coordinator for Bristol and the South West. So it's our honour as Bristol Fair Trade to be hosting the International Fair Trade Towns Conference. And we're delighted to be kicking off with this Green Capital Day. We deliberately put this on as an extra for the conference because we are very proud that Bristol is Green Capital this year. And we thought if you are coming all the way to Bristol, it'd be a shame to come and not learn about how we won Green Capital. So thank you for signing up and being part of our day. Um, Vicky from Green Capital Partnership will run you through what's happening over the day. But I really just wanted to welcome you to the city, welcome you to the conference, and I really hope you have an inspiring and educational time. So thank you for being here. Thank you. and I'm the uh, Operations Manager with Bristol Green Capital Partnership. So I've been working with Jenny and Fairtrade Bristol on uh, arranging this day for you. And what we hope to do is give you a flavour of Bristol as a European Green Capital. Um, what I'm going to do is give you a very brief overview of the journey to becoming a European Green Capital. Um, but throughout the day there will be various talks, uh, a tour on a boat um, and chance to ask questions later. So if you don't have a programme already, there's some more on the desk at the back, so please do grab one. Um, so as I said, we look forward to sharing with you a bit of an overview of Bristol as a Green Capital Partnership and discuss some of the initiatives, projects and organisations who've played a part in this journey. And we'd like to set the scene for a weekend that is exploring the links between sustainability, climate change and fair trade. Uh, Fairtrade Bristol has been a long-term partner with the Bristol Green Capital Partnership um, and for us that really exemplifies Bristol's commitment and our leadership in uh, supporting businesses and individuals to make sustainable, ethical and socially conscious choices. So, what and who is the Bristol Green Capital Partnership? The partnership was originally established in 2007 as a Bristol City Council initiative uh, you're going to be hearing from uh, later this afternoon from Emily talking about Bristol's green roots. So she'll discuss some of the uh, backgrounds to Bristol's environmental movement that the Bristol Green Capital Partnership emerged from. The aim of the Green Capital Partnership is to bring together an organisation who shared the same aim to help make Bristol become a low carbon city with a high quality of life for all. That was the pledge that we asked organisations to make when they joined the partnership and that's still the founding principle of the Green Capital Partnership today. When the Green Capital Partnership launched in 2007, there was 12 organisations. There's 830 today. The partnership's been dedicated to cross-sector um, organisations and collaboration and sharing. And through this network, there was a series of reports, events, grants and networking, all that helped strengthen the sector, sustainability sector in Bristol. I'm giving you a brief overview, but there's some people in the room today that are experts at the Green Capital Partnership. We have Martin Big, who was the chair of the partnership in 2012 and 2013. Is that right? Sure. We have uh, Darren Hall, who was the manager of the Bristol Green Capital Partnership. Uh, we have Elaine that worked on the Green Capital Partnership. So during today, please do ask your questions um, and I'm sure that they'll be willing to share some stories about the Green Capital Partnership. Um, just a couple of examples uh, from the partnership. So one of the initiatives that was supported in the early stages of the Green Capital Partnership was Bristol Pound. And I think over this weekend, you may have a Bristol Pound in your delegate packs that you'll be able to spend in Bristol. So it's the UK's first city-wide currency and the first one that you can use to pay local taxes. Um, another example is Triodos Bank. Triodos Bank is upstairs. It's a long-term member of the Green Capital Partnership and it's a world leader in sustainable banking. And this is actually their UK headquarters in Bristol and one of the most sustainably built offices in the UK. So we'll also be having a short tour of Triodos after these talks so that you can learn a bit more about their work, about how they support fair trade in the South West and how they have an exceptionally sustainable office building. Another example of some of the work that Bristol Green Capital Partnership has done was a commissioned was their work sorry, on helping Bristol to become a sustainable food city. 
They founded a, a commissioned a report called Who Feeds Bristol that made a series of recommendations and analyses of the sustainable food system in Bristol. Out of that, there was a good food plan for Bristol and a food policy council, who again has worked very closely with fair trade in the South West. I'm really pleased that later today, towards the end of the day, we'll be hearing from Angela Raffle, who is involved in the Food Policy Council, and we'll be able to share a little bit of background about the work that Bristol's doing in its sustainable food, to become a sustainable food city. So, to the European Green Capital Award. So when the Green Capital Partnership was founded in 2007, it was in the March. A few months later, in the August, the EU uh, launched a new scheme called the European Green Capital Award. So obviously, this was something that Bristol wanted to apply for, so that it could share and match its progress against some of the other greener cities in the UK. Um, and I'm really, really pleased that later today, we'll hear from Alex Minchell from the Bristol City Council Sustainable Cities team, who led the bid process uh, when we win the award. Um, and we'll also be hearing, he's not here now, but from a Professor James Longhurst from the University of West of England. We'll be sharing a little bit with you about air quality and transport in Bristol, but also sharing how the universities are working in close partnership with the city um, throughout the bid process and also as an ongoing basis. So Bristol applied three times to win the award, and we won. Uh, and 2015 is our year as European Green Capital. There's three main organisations involved in our year as Green Capital. I've just given you a little bit of an overview of Bristol Green Capital Partnership. You'll be hearing more uh, from representatives from the City Council later today. And I'm also really pleased to introduce Zoe Sia from Bristol 2015, who will be telling you a little bit more about what's happening this year. So Bristol 2015 was established this year to help facilitate a citywide initiative as the European Green Capital. They've raised significant funds that's really helped to catalyse and launch a lot of really exciting new initiatives and projects from a lot of the partnership members that are working in food, energy, resources, transport, and, and resources, and, and energy. Um, so she'll be sharing with you a little bit more about the year very soon. Uh, one of our final speakers towards the end of the day is uh, Liz Ziegler. Now Liz is the chair of the Bristol Green Capital Partnership last year and this year, and she's going to be sharing with you a little bit about how this year is a really important opportunity for the Bristol Green Capital Partnership Although the partnership was founded within the council in 2007, we're now an independent community interest company. And this year is a really exciting opportunity for us to launch as a legacy body for the 2015 year and help to strengthen the sector. And we're going to carry on working really strongly with Fairtrade Network throughout that journey. Um, one final thing, as you'll see on your programmes, if you do have them, uh, there's a lot of really exciting projects that have been launched this year. Uh, many of them thanks to the funding that's been delivered through Bristol 2015. The conference this weekend will be held in at Bristol, which is at uh, Millennium Square. You'll see some evidence of those projects around Millennium Square. There's an edible food trail that's been set up from the Temple Mead station right the way to at Bristol. So if you see lots of pop-up beds with lettuce and food, um, that's been put in for this year uh, and is really good at raising awareness of urban growing. And we also have a water fountain in Millennium Square uh, that was launched as well as part of a campaign about reducing uh, single-use plastic, about reducing waste, about health and well-being, and they also have an energy turbine in there. So as you see, there's lots of really exciting projects happening this, day, this year that you'll get to find out about this weekend. Um, one of those projects is Bristol Loves Tides. So you're going to go on a journey on a boat this afternoon uh, and you will meet several young people on that boat that have been involved in a project called Bristol Loves Tides. They're acting as student journalists and will talk to you to discuss your relationship with water, your city's relationship with water and how integral that is to Bristol's um, infrastructure. 
So I would encourage you, there will be some commentary on the boat telling you a little bit about the history of the harbourside, but please do um, join uh, these young representatives and um, answer their questions and get involved um, with the boat tour. And I think that's it. The end point of the day after the boat tour, you will be at um, joining at Create Centre. Uh, it's a large building that is very much an environmental hub for Bristol. So Bristol City Council Sustainable City Team lives there and uh, also many of our organisations. <laughs> um, and you also get to have a tour of an eco home and you'll end the day with a, a fair trade meal from the Create Centre Cafe which is going to be showcasing a lot of the locally sourced produce as well from Bristol. So I hope that gives some background and I'm going to introduce you to Zoe Sienna who's going to talk a little bit about Bristol 2015 and events this year. Hello everybody, I'm Zoe Sear, I'm a communication director for Bristol 2015 and I'm very good at breaking things and being clumsy. <laughs> um, so that's, uh, you've heard from Vicky, that's a really great overview, I think Vicky's just going to fiddle with my slides, of um, Bristol's journey to becoming European Green Capital. Um, and you can see here, this is obviously the identity that we've created for the 2015 company. Um, really common, all former winners of European Green Capital have felt the need to create their own kind of mark or stamp, because otherwise you're kind of classed with just using the uh, European Commission's one. So, um, like many people, I'm just duplicating Vicky's slide here, so everybody is crystal clear, I work for the company in the middle. So we're the short-term company um, that was set up predominantly to fundraise, market and promote um, a city-wide initiative for the year. And like many of the team, I'm on secondment for another organisation, so I'm actually on secondment from the Mayor's Office at Bristol City Council, which I think is great because um, obviously the Mayor was very involved in Bristol's bid uh, when we went for the third time to win, um, and I've worked in the city for a long time, and I'm really, really fortunate to be able to do lots of really exciting stuff off the back of lots of other people's hard work over many, many years. So the award itself, interestingly, comes with a relatively short time scale. You have about 18 months to plan your year, and it doesn't come with any money. So most European green capitals have been able to secure about a million pounds sterling um, for their year. Um, we secured that, but also I think part of the reason why Bristol won, which we're not going to dwell on too much, was the scale of its ambition and as well as its huge achievements in this space over many, many years and its sort of sense of fun, which we'll come on to talk about a little bit more. Um, we've effectively been able to turn that million pounds investment to just under 14 million, which is pretty unheard of for a European green capital. So it means the stakes are quite high, the level of expectation is quite high. Um, we've secured £7 million from the UK government, which obviously the Department of Energy and Climate Change clearly recognise the significance of the work that's being done here in Bristol and across Europe. And also we've taken the opportunity out to the private sector. So we've got Tier 1 sponsors in KPMG, Skanska and First Group, who run a lot of our transport infrastructure, and many other supporters both paid, Vicky mentioned Triodos, they're one of our sponsors, but also building really strong partnerships with our universities, with our key business organisations, um, to really kind of harness all the energy in the city. So it's probably fair to say you don't win green capital because you're perfect, because what city is, because um, if we were all perfect we wouldn't have, uh, we wouldn't be facing many of the challenges that cities are currently facing, um, but obviously you win because you have um, excelled across a very, uh, very thorough technical assessment, but you also have plans, energy, you know, exciting, um, exciting ideas about how you can address some of the challenges ahead. So in Bristol's case, we are blessed with, as Vicky has touched on, a really, really strong history in this space with our, with our Green Capital Partnership. And we also have a lot of really exciting plans and a lot of um, really important knowledge that we can share with other cities. So when we won, as I said, we, had a, we, we were very ambitious and we also wanted to make sustainability fun. 
and it's quite interesting. I stand before you not as an expert in environmental, sustainable climate change issues, which again I think is good because I'm very representative of the 500,000 people that live in this city that we're trying to talk to about making sustainability part of their everyday life. So we have, as 2015, three kind of really big goals, which we'll then drill down into briefly. So there's a big piece for us about local empowerment. How can we get local people, local organisations involved in the year? We commit to the European Commission as a winner to share our sustainability knowledge and demonstrate leadership in this space to help other cities and other organisations learn from us. And there's a big piece about international reach, profiling the work that Bristol is doing and also the work that the European Commission is doing um, on a much bigger stage because, you know, let's be honest, this is a global issue, it's not just a European one. My key stopped working. And again, on the basis that you've got a year and you've got a finite amount of money to spend, you can't do everything. So in Bristol, we've chosen to focus in on five key areas where we either have particular strengths that we can share with others, such as food, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail, and nature, and then other areas where, like many other cities, we face the same challenges, so areas like energy, transport, and resources. Now, if we had sound, I would play you... Ooh. I think it's, it now thinks there's a speaker and it's going to play. It's not going to work because we don't have a speaker. But if we did, what you would see... <laughs> you, can, you can go to the website. I could do a little mime and dance for you, but I'm not going to. Um, so this is, this is a small kind of introductory video which we can make the link available to you. So this is Joe Underwood, who's a 12-year-old schoolboy, talking about what sustainability means for Bristol. And the essence of this, because as well as those really big goals we have committed to try and bring about behaviour change across the city. That is no mean feat, even with £14 million, big brands spend a lot of money trying to get us to change our behaviour. But Joe makes the point that actually, if every single person in the city did one more thing this year, over and above what they currently do to make the city that bit greener and healthier, that would have a really big impact. So one of the quite fun and exciting things we've done um, this year is introduce our Do 15 in 15 campaign. So I'm going to dive straight down into some of the stuff we're actually doing. Um, and a bit like companies have to pledge to do some stuff when they join the Green Capital Partnership, we wanted to ask people's permission before we started wagging a finger at them, telling them what to do differently. Um, because obviously everything tells us that that just causes people to switch off. So the conversation we're having, that is Joe in the picture there with his family. And this is our Do 15 pledge button. And A, it's very visually appealing. It's a great media prop because we are trying to work with the media as much as possible to raise the profile of what we're doing. And it's fun. When you push the button to say yes... I'm in for doing something over and above what I currently do this year to make the city that bit greener and healthier. You hit the button, some people hit it quite hard, I'm a bit worried about my button. Um, it kind of cheers and applauses and then we can help and we have um, a whole range, you can see in the picture there, the Do15 leaflet that working with many of the experts from within the partnership we've identified the kind of things that people could do differently and that might be you know for some people that's about starting to recycle their food for others it's about much more fundamental change because they're much further down that journey so this is something we're having quite a lot of fun with and to keep it alive we're encouraging high profile celebrities to push the button i don't know how many people in the audience will know the kaiser chiefs George Ezra, yeah? So they were in Bristol last week and I'm delighted, as I'm sure they are, that they got to push the button and pledge to do something differently um, this year. And you can see it's not just about celebrities. You can see Triodos at the end, they have Blackboard Friday. They're regular users of the button. There are actually two now because it's in such demand. Um, and all their staff are pushing and pledging just using really simple chalkboards and things. And we're taking that out into the community as well, doing a lot of outreach work 
recognising Bristol's a really big city with quite a wide-ranging geography. It's not all about the city centre. So, <coughs> hmm, I, think, I think there's too many big images in mind. Um, another really big audience for us to talk to is um, the business community. Obviously, business generates um, a lot of waste, employs a lot of people, uses a lot of energy. Um, so we've commissioned Business West and Low Carbon South West, two very active members in this space, to deliver Go Green this year. And that's very much about working with businesses, um, many of whom, as I've said, will be at very different points on their journey to green in their business. This has gone fantastically well since we launched it in February. So we've had over, a hun a hundred, <laughs> over 800 businesses attend events. And what's been really encouraging for people is seeing some really new faces telling us that we're actually starting to engage with um, a wider audience. One other thing which you, some of you going on the tours might see, this is a bit of a dark night shot. Um, so we have uh, temporary office accommodation. I say temporary because when we go, uh, Bristol Energy Company will move in, which again is a really exciting project as part of our year. We're based down on the harbour side and this is our public engagement drop-in space. So in the school holidays, this is open. This is where people can come in and find out more. There are workshops, there are demonstrations, there are talks. It's available for community groups to use um, as an additional space. Um, it's where you might have been today had we not been getting ready next week for the really exciting launch of part of our National Schools programme, which I will come on to. Um, so again, this is really uh, great for having a place where people can come and find out more. So with all the money that we've raised, which as I said sounds a lot, but clearly the government didn't give it us with no strings attached, so there's a really clear expectation about what we'll do with it, we've been able to invest £2 million worth of projects uh, £2 million pounds into projects across the city and that ranges from really, really small projects that just needed £500 to really big projects that are um, a maximum of £30,000. And there was quite clear criteria that each of the projects that were seeking funding had to support the outcomes across the five themes that Bristol is looking to achieve this year. So there's some nice little pictures there to illustrate transport, food, waste, again, particular focus on plastics, as Vicky mentioned, um, and also nature. So that's activity running across the city, and a lot of this information is available on our website, which is a key tool where lots of organisations, literally hundreds, are uploading their own events that aren't actually part of our core programme, but we're there to help enable what they're doing. Here's a picture of the first six artists that were commissioned to actually go out into the community and consult with them about what a piece of art that symbolised how they felt about sustainability or green issues looked to them. And that's about not taking a blanket approach, but very much doing proper consultation with local people. So these are local artists, the first six there, which have got going. Um, we divide the city up into kind of 14 areas, if you like. Um, so there'll be 14 projects rolling out um, across the summer. And we also have quite a big focus on volunteering, both engaging um, our citizens in getting involved in the Green Capital Year, but also as part of legacy work, encouraging people to be more active citizens. Um, Bristol is a city of service, so we're also recognised and working very closely with the City Council team the people you can see here are our welcome hosts who are out and about predominantly on weekends welcoming visitors to um, Bristol as European Green Capital. Probably one of the most exciting strands, I think, is the National Schools Programme. So this is a three-year education programme which will start in Bristol that has the really big goal of encouraging the teaching of sustainability in every primary school in the UK. So that's no small ambition. It's obviously something that the UK government were very keen to get involved with. So to date, and you can see some school children here from Bristol, we've had 7,000 primary school age children go through a series of workshops, again, aligned to each of our themes. Um, the face of this is Sean the Sheep. So has everybody here heard of Wallace and Gromit? 
yeah. So obviously art and animations are based here in Bristol. We get very involved in many local initiatives. So Sean, obviously there's a new movie out. Um, on Monday, if any of you are still here then, that's when the Bristol leg of the Sean Trail starts and that's beautiful ceramic statues around the city. Um, more excitingly for me uh, is Sustainable Sean is the computer game, I suppose, recognising that many young children like to engage with technology. So we're piloting here in Bristol for six weeks, Sustainable Sean from next week, um, which is quite interesting. So Sean the Sheep has a brown food site and you start to see the choices he makes about what he does with the resources he's got and the impact it has. So um, really exciting. As I said, trialling it here in Bristol with a view to launching that nationally later on this year. And... You know, if I had hours and hours, I could tell you about every single thing <laughs> happening. Obviously, there are many things I don't know about, and that's good because it's about creating the right environment so people go off and do their own thing. I just thought, given that we have a very um, diverse international audience here, you might be interested in, in some of the summits, conferences and debates that are happening across the city. Um, we, as 2015, are organising some core summits we had the first one back in April, which was our Green Youth Day. And you'll notice the thread here, there is a really strong focus on young people. And of course, it's not rocket science to recognise that they are the citizens of tomorrow. And if you start talking to young people really early on about these issues, it just becomes normalised. And they will hopefully pick up the mantle of all, a lot of the great work that's being done and take that forward. So we had a thousand young people here at Colston Hall, big venue just behind me. Again, really engaging with some really interesting speakers, different topics, looking at, again, fair trade issues came up, buying your clothing from um, suppliers that don't use, um, you know, I was about to say slave labour, I got distracted by Vicky signalling me to hurry up, which I will do, I'm nearly on the last one. Um, and again, with, with some international um, interest, our business summit and city leadership summit we will particularly for the City Leadership Summit be promoting that out to our international networks. Anybody that's involved in leading a city will hopefully find that of interest. And, and a bit like yourselves, we are hosting and we're very fortunate to be hosting a number of events like this. So just earlier this week we had the International Making Cities Livable Conference here, which was a couple of hundred delegates coming from America to come to Bristol again in the same way that you have because we're European Green Capital keen to be part of it and see it for themselves. Um, Euro cities, many of the cities that you come from will potentially be part of this network. There's an event in October with them. And again, the university is doing a lot around the summit week to look at, from an academic point of view, the issues of climate change. We also move into our Festival of the Future City. And ultimately, the city is, um, I don't know whether it's a challenge or an opportunity that the UN Climate Change Summit meets this year in Paris. So working closely with central government and also um, with leaders to say, you know, what's the Bristol message? What are we saying? What do we want to do? Finally, um, the Bristol method, um, again, I put this in as something that will potentially be of interest to you. This is quite a thorough knowledge transfer program, which sounds a bit grand. I just say it's a way of sharing our learning with people that want to learn from Bristol in really bite-sized, accessible chunks. So the website at the bottom shows you where you can go to download these, and we're drip feeding them throughout the year because potentially there will be you know, quite a lot of topics covered. The first six topics are up here. And again, they've been produced working very much with the expertise we have in the city, both within the Green Capital Partnership and within lots of different sectors and organisations. And again, there's a strong legacy here for cities looking to learn from us. So my final slide just um, flashes up how you can keep in touch with what Bristol 2015 is doing. Um, I mentioned our website is a really key um, area to keep in touch with. So I'm really pleased. At the half-year point, um, so far, we've engaged with um, over 200,000 people in the city via a mixture of the events that we've held, cultural events and other activities. Um, and our Facebook, our Twitter, lots of things, we're building really large audiences. So um, there's still lots to do, but I think we've got the year off to a flying start. Um, 
I will pause there and say thank you very much for your attention. this afternoon uh, but for now we try and like to keep you uh, active this afternoon so we have arranged a tour of three of us upstairs but it's quite a large group so what we're going to do is split the group in half mm -hmm. and half will stay down here and have a talk uh, from Emily Brownlee who's going to talk about Bristol's green roots and the other half will go upstairs with Tom Owen who's Triados' business development manager to have a tour of the building and then the groups will swap so you don't get to miss out on any of those. And then when the two groups come back together again, we're going to take you on a short walk, it's about 15 minutes, to where we're going to embark on a boat for your tour on Bristol's Harbourside. So the best way that we thought to split the group is that all of those in the room whose first name falls between A and L, including L, you'll be the first group to go upstairs with Tom and treat us. So if you could all, if Tom could wave his hand. Um, I work for an organisation called the Schumacher Institute. Uh, we're a research organisation based here in Bristol. Um, and from 2010 to 2011, we ran a project called Bristol's Green Roots, which looked at the history of the environmental movement in Bristol. Um, so I spent a year interviewing uh, over 100 different people um, from businesses, SME, small to medium enterprises, organisations, people from the council, individuals who've been involved in developing Bristol's environmental movement. Um, and we ran the timeline that we took was from 1970-ish to the present day. From the information that I gathered speaking to these 100 different people um, who share, were willing to share their perspectives, memories and thoughts about the development of the environmental movement in the city, uh, we developed an archive which was full of materials like photos and leaflets around initiatives that had started in the early days. I did some video interviews as well um, and from this we also developed an exhibition which, was, in situate, uh, which is, was situated at the Create Centre which is where you'll be visiting later on today um, and there is still a cardboard um, uh, portable exhibition there which you can have a look at later. Um, and I also wrote a 70,000 word book on the different stories um, across a different range of themes so we went from food, energy, transport built environments, um, top-down and bottom-up initiatives. Um, and I also spoke to young people and community groups to try and get them to think about what the meaning of looking at Bristol's environmental history was and what it could mean for learning the lessons that people discovered for the future of our sustainable city. Uh, so why did we want to run the project? Well, um, our director, Ian um, Roderick, who runs the Schumacher Institute, has realised that some of the people who were involved in the early days of the environmental movement in Bristol were getting on a bit. Um, and he didn't want to lose the stories that were sure to be full of really interesting insights um, and achievements, but also challenges that they faced and that we could learn from for the future. Um, and we wanted to share the stories um, and make sure that they, they weren't lost and kind of capture the examples of change to see if we could learn from them. So when did it all start? Um, it's very difficult to pinpoint a year to say this is when Bristol's uh, modern environmental movement started and I wouldn't try to do that. But a lot of the people I spoke to said that um, kind of after the war, Bristol was looking to rebuild. Um, it was very badly bombed, um, and alongside this there was a massive drive, drive for modernisation which was coming over from America, um, and people were looking to building big roads, big shops, um, and kind of trying to look at making our city modern and uh, fit for the future. 
but um, there was a development plan that was finalised in 1966 by the council and as part of this plan it was suggested that Bristol's floating harbour would be filled in um, which is what you, you'll see later, you may have already seen the floating harbour today um, and I think it's something that Bristol is really proud of, it loves being on the water, we, we have a lot of ferries um, in the summer when you go down there as you can see, so this is a recent photo, people sit along the water and drink, it's quite a sociable place and I think the thought of um, this area being filled in filled people with horror um, and um, alongside the road, this being filled in, um, there are plans for something called the Outer Circuit Road, which would have completely changed the face of Bristol. It would have gone through all the major green space that we have. Um, it would have gone through several different communities in the city, splitting them in two, um, creating air pollution, separated communities, um, and basically just not a very nice city feel. Um, so a group of different people came together, so from community activists to people who were concerned about the social implications, people who were concerned about the environmental implications. And that kind of bringing together of those two different groups really started to mark the beginning of the sustainability movement in the city. Um, the Bristol City Docks group was formed, which was a group of concerned citizens from community activists to local architects and they wanted to look at how they could make the Bristol Harbour area a space for people, not a space for cars, um, and whether that could be used to encourage the um, plans for the Outer Circuit Road and the filling in of the harbour to be uh, postponed or cancelled. Um, so they actually released a series of seven reports which looked at how the, city, uh, how the area could become a space for people, for culture, for play and for, um, for the future of the city. Um, and during this time, uh, the Arnolfini, which is an arts exhibition space, was set up. Then the Industrial Museum was set up by the council in the late 70s. Um, and then the watershed opened in the early 80s. And during this time, because these things were getting set up and people were starting to use that space more, um, the plans for the Outer Circuit Road and the filling in of the harbour were shelved. And thankfully, we still have it today. So what else happened? So the early 1970s globally was a big point for the um, environmental movement and Bristol Friends of the Earth was one of the first to be founded in England. Um, it started in 1971 and ended up becoming the first office of, Brist of Friends of the Earth outside of London. Um, their main uh, areas of interest were resources, uh, campaigning against nuclear power, mining and pollution. And so you can see here is a group of them that collected um, waste cans um, and cycled up to Downing Street to protest against the fact that there was no recycling uh, provision in the city. Um, and as part of their work, they also set up a curb curbside recycling scene where they picked up newspaper, sold it and then used the profits to insulate um, vulnerable people's homes. So they were very much about bringing together those social and environmental concerns. Um, so the commercial side of that kind of picking up the recycling and, and, and getting money from it was picked up by Avon Friends of the Earth, who ran with it throughout the 1980s. And as you can see, they picked up recycling via horse and cart, very, very sustainable transport. I think it was probably a mix of uh, quirkiness and uh, low cost was the drivers behind that. Um, and it was very much a commercial venture, um, so it separated off from Bristol Friends of the Earth. Um, and actually became the founding of an organisation called Bristol Recycling Consortium, which is now Resource Futures, a national charity that looks at waste minimisation in the UK. And is still based in Bristol, actually at the Create Centre. Um, and they very much identified, everyone I spoke to who was involved with that, identified as community action as key to innovation in the city. So needing to listen to people and what they wanted and what, what they could create the markets for. Another massive organisation that started in the 1970s was uh, initially called Cyclebag and it's now called Sustrans. So they are responsible for hundreds of miles of cycle paths in the country. But they started out um, at a Bristol Friends of the Earth rally on the oil embargo that was going on. Um, and John Grimshaw, who was the uh, managing director of um, Sustrans for many years, he spoke about the importance of cycling capacity in Bristol as a form of protest against using um, mass transport uh, and oil, oil use. 
Um, they initially founded as a campaign and advocacy group, but it became really clear that what was needed was action. Um, and so in the late 70s, they moved to, onto building cycle paths. Um, and uh, the picture there you can see is the opening of the Bristol to Bath railway path um, in 1984, which is an incredibly popular cycle route in the city. The Urban Centre for Appropriate Technology set up in the late 70s as well. Um, so this was uh, some people who were interested in alternative and appropriate technologies went up to the Centre for Alternative Technology in McKenwith in Wales. Um, but they realised this was a very rural um, setting for looking at alternative energy. They wanted to do something that was a bit more urban. So they um, created a visitor centre in Bristol city centre um, from a renovated terrace house. It had um, energy efficient properties like draft exclusion, solar panels, insulation um, and out of it they um, ran energy advice and training for anyone who wanted to know how to make their houses more sustainable and energy efficient um, and they also um, used any money that they made to go around and insulate vulnerable people's homes again bringing together those social and environmental concerns. Um, and the Urban Centre for Appropriate Technology evolved over the next 30 years and has now become the Centre for Sustainable Energy in Bristol, which again is a massive national charity. So all of these things are really rooted in community action and social enterprise. It was basically just people who saw something that needed doing and they did it. Um, they often worked in partnership um, and tried to look for local business support to make sure they had a market for any goods or things that they collected, like the recycling. Um, and they all struggled with finding funding, resources and office space. It's good to know that some things never change. Um, as you see, this picture here is a um, nuclear power protest that uh, Friends of the Earth and the Urban Centre for Appropriate Technology ran. And it was great to see that they kind of, you know, because resources were so short, people banded together and, and tried to do things uh, to maximise their impact. Something else which really supported the early days of Bristol's environmental movement was something called the Youth Opportunities Programme. And during my time running this project, I spoke to a lot of people who were involved. And they'd, at, the same, at, at this time in the early 1980s, um, Bristol was in a very similar situation to it is in now. High unemployment, we were in a recession. Um, but the government came up with something where um, people who were unemployed got paid minimum wage to work for community enterprises. Um, and it was massively popular, young people came together, they worked on projects which were rewarding um, and they provided support for um, organisations that were just starting out. Something else which people said time and time again was really useful to the beginning of the environmental movement was shared space. So in the 1980s, Colston Street became a hot spot for um, environmental and social initiatives. There were about eight or nine different organisations there. Um, and there were so many that the local postman called it Save the World Street. <laughs> um, this conglomeration and collection of organisations actually started out the Ethical Property Company, which is now, again, a national organisation that looks at providing office space for organisations that want to do um, social and environmental work in, the, in, in their city. Um, and it, more than just bringing together organisations, it created networks um, for advice, Support, we all know that working for sustainability or um, fair trade um, can be draining and difficult and bringing people together to kind of provide those support networks is really useful. So what happened next? Throughout the 80s and 90s there was a lot of action in Bristol around um, protection of green space, um, trying to protect biodiversity and also reusing buildings that were otherwise empty. Again, I think that was going alongside the fact that it was a recession at the time and people wanted to maximise the space that we already had. Um, and there was also ongoing development of local environmental groups and um, some great engagement from the council as well. Um, and then 2000s, there was a massive boom in the creation of local groups, so I'm talking you know, street-based, community-based action around sustainability. Um, and in 2007, Bristol became the UK's first transition city. Um, this picture here is uh, two people abseiling off a bridge in a um, green space called Royce Hill, um, which was going to be uh, demolished, um, and they ended up saving the space, which is still there today. Um, I won't spend too long on this, because Vicky um, has already outlined it, and I know they'll be speaking about it later on today as well. But um, you can't talk about Bristol's green history without mentioning the fact that 
In 2003, um, the Community Strategy for Bristol, which was developed by the Bristol Partnership, included a line called, uh, that stated, um, Bristol could be a green capital in Europe, creating sustainable communities and improving the quality of life. So again, bringing together that social and environmental concerns. Um, so this was a good five years before the Green Capital Award actually emerged out of the European Union. Um, and a man called Joe Gipps noticed this and um, set in motion the development of the Bristol Green Capital Partnership, the first 12 pledges you can see there. Um, and I'm, you'll hear more about this later on today. Um, and Bristol Fair Trade. Um, I couldn't talk about it today without mentioning this. Um, so Bristol became a fair trade city in 2005 um, and it's had its, sorry, it's had its status renewed every two years. Um, sorry, fair trade status has to be reviewed every two years and Bristol's never failed, unsurprisingly due to the fantastic work of Jenny and other fair trade volunteers in the city. Um, and it's also um, won the Outstanding Achievement Award in the Fair Trade Foundation Awards 2011. And I'm just going to read a quotation here. So in the uh, renewal of Bristol's fair trade status in 2010, the Fair Trade Foundation commented that Without a doubt, Bristol City Council continues to be one of the pioneer authorities in terms of promoting and adopting fair trade and in offering genuine support to the wider network as it seeks to take this commitment out across the wider community. Um, and Bristol Fair Trade hasn't just you know, won these awards and um, achieved its status, it's also won several trailblazing campaigns in the last decades, including the world's largest fair trade fashion shows, which are absolutely fantastic. Um, and the World's First Fair Trade Business Awards, again, really enjoyable to see the local kind of organisations getting stuck in with fair trade. Um, and it also has uh, innovative fair trade producer visits, which reach thousands of children um, in partnership with Bristol Link with Nicaragua. Um, and it also sets up a fantastic team of volunteer fair trade ambassadors who go out and uh, talk about fair trade and how fantastic it is. Um, and I, it's been great to be involved with this because I think fair trade is such a fantastic example of how you can bring together environmental and social concerns and push forward development in that area. So I spoke a lot about how Bristol's Green Roots tried to pinpoint some of the lessons that we can all learn. Um, and the things that I really drew from it were that Shared space is really important, that um, it's about collaboration um, and trying to work together. It can be difficult for people and organisations in the sustainability um, sector because uh, we're fighting for funding and attention and press coverage, um, but we shouldn't let that uh, affect kind of working together. And I think a lot of people spoke about how much they found that real change got achieved when, um, especially through cross-sector collaboration with the council. Um, support systems are really important, so the Youth Opportunity Scheme providing you know, um, low-cost labour that was rewarding for both parties. Um, and council involvement, time and time again people spoke about how valuable it was to have a council that was supportive of um, things, so council that did provide buildings for organisations that were looking to set up and things like that. Um, and that cross-sector partnership, so making sure that people are listening to diverse perspectives um, and that uh, sometimes you know, it can be easy to see that the sustainability movement can be talking to itself, but um, bringing together different people and sharing skills and expertise is really important. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.